Welcome to the Financial Planning Certification Exam Lessons Podcast. This is going to be a sample lesson of the full series of audio lessons which are available at the website fplessons.com. That means financialplanninglessons.com, fplessons.com. At the website, you can find the full series of audio lessons. The full series of audio lessons consists of six different sections. Those sections include general financial planning principles, professional conduct and regulation, insurance planning and insurance products, investment planning, tax planning, retirement savings and income planning, and finally estate planning. A total of six different sections. You can buy the individual sections at the website fplessons.com. All right, let's get on to this sample lesson. This is Financial Planning Lessons, audio lessons for the Financial Planning Certification Exam. This is Part 6, covering estate planning, narrated by Nika Miramadi. This is Lesson 3. Hello, and welcome to a review of estate planning for the Financial Planning Certification Exam. This is Episode 3. If you have not listened to the previous two episodes, I highly recommend doing so before you hop on here. But without further ado, let's get started. We are going to start discussing estate tax compliance and calculating the taxes for estate tax, sources for the liquidity of your estate, and any powers of appointment. Okay, lots to discuss here. Okay, so estate tax filing, that is with Form 706. Okay, that's the federal estate tax form that has to be filed for all decedents who are citizens or residents with a total gross estate plus any adjustable taxable gifts equaling or greater than the amount of the exception exemption for the year of death. I know for 2023 it was like 12.9 million and then for 2024 it is something like 13.6 million. So I want to emphasize that this form and generally any estate tax only applies to people who have estates that are larger than in 2024 13.6 million. Okay? If you have 13 million, you will not have to worry about estate taxes or filing this form. That is very important. I like to to call this like estate tax people. Are you an estate tax person? Do you even have to worry about estate tax? Because it's very easy to just assume that everyone's going to have to pay this hefty estate tax when in reality <laughs> you're under the exemption. So again, estate tax people, anyone with an estate over 13.6 million. Okay. Other than that, the exemption covers it. You're fine. So the executor of your estate is responsible for paying this tax. So for the purposes of the exam, you're not going to have to complete the calculation for federal estate tax liability, but it is important to understand the process. So all right, uh, I'm debating how I want to tackle this. So there's probate assets and then there's non-probate assets and all of those go into your gross estate. So let me just list these off. This is something that's also very important to like memorize and have sink in because it's very easy to mix these up. So again, if you're a visual learner, write it out whatever, figure it out. <laughs> okay. So probate assets are, again, singly owned assets, tenancy in common or tick, the beneficiaries, of the estate, and community property. Let's remember that. Okay. This is all included in the gross estate. What is also included in the gross estate is all non-probate assets, right? So things like joint tenants with rights of survivorship. Remember, 
it just immediately, you know, the interest is given to the other person or tenancy by the entirety. Okay, so these are non-probate assets. Life insurance is a non-probate asset. General powers are non-probate. Any gift taxes paid three years, those are non-probate. Okay, these, although separate, And it's important to know which one's probate, which one's non-probate. These are all included in the gross estate, right? Gross always means like total. All right. So then from the gross estate, we subtract funeral expenses, administration expenses, any debts, any taxes, any losses, et cetera. Okay. That is when we get to the adjusted gross estate. From that point, we take the marital deduction down and the charitable deductions, and that is the taxable estate. You're going to add any taxable gifts that you've made to the taxable estate, and that is your base, okay? So at this point, at this taxable base point, if you are under the exemption, or basically if you subtract the exemption and there's nothing left, then you're fine. No estate taxes, Okay, anything above this ex- exemption, the thirteen point six million, that is going to be taxed at forty percent. Okay, and that's going to be the tentative tax, and then you're going to subtract subtract any gift taxes that were paid, and then that is your net estate tax. The really important portion to know is, I'd say, like the first two, three, two or three steps that I just said. The only time, you know, that tax base is important is when you're considering, is this an estate tax person? Are their assets above $13.6 after all these calculations, okay? So remember, gross estate, going to subtract any expenses, debts, taxes. That's when you have the adjusted gross estate. That is when you're going to have the marital deduction and charitable deduction kick in, but you're going to add back some taxable gifts, and then that is your tax base. Okay. All right, so Form 706 is generally going to be filed for any estates that are over that $13.6 million and owe taxes, okay? There are, however, two other relevant tax forms that you need to know at death, Almost everyone is going to have their final 1040 due for any income that was earned in the year of death. This is no different than any other year. This is the normal 1040, okay? A 1041, this is a income tax return for an estate, will also be due if the decedent's estate earns income after death, okay? And before the assets are divided up to their heirs, okay? So if there's a very lengthy process of dividing up these assets and splitting them amongst the beneficiaries or the heirs, then an income is generated within that estate. A 1041 needs to be filed. And a 1041 is not necessary if the deceased person's estate receives no income or realizes no capital gains, okay? That is literally just if the estate gains income before it is properly divvied amongst heirs, okay? So just, again, think about who is an estate tax person. Not many people have more than $12 million in assets, okay? So you you want to focus more on estate issues that can apply to everyone, not just this tax, okay? All right, so let's discuss the gross estate. I kind of did like an overview of the tax calculation, but let's get into the nitty gritty of it all. So the gross estate is the total fair market value of any property and interest owned or held by the decedent at the time of death. And this is before subtracting, remember the deductions, the debts, the admin expenses, credit, anything, anything, okay? Gross. It's all of it, okay? Inclusions, so things that are included. Some examples include furniture in your home, the home itself, like the ownership of it, any personal interests, any investments, intangible intangible properties like patents, okay? So joint tenancy with a spouse would be one half includable, right? 
joint tenancy with a non-spouse is going to be subject to the consideration test that I mentioned earlier. Remember the receipts, like you have to prove how much you put into something or continue to put into something unless it's going to be like an arbitrary, like even split, right? So you want to make sure the proper amount is included in your estate, right? So that's going to be taken through a consideration test. Hope you kept your receipts. And life insurance can be included in the gross estate. And that is how state liquidity is is provided, basically. Remember, we're talking about the gross estate. These are all probate and non-probate assets. It doesn't matter if it's going to go through the court or not. This is just everything under the sun that, that you owned or had your finger in or your toe in or your leg in or your... Anyway, you get the point. So on and so forth. The three-year rule. So there are two three-year rules. One is for gift taxes paid and the other one is for life insurance. So let's discuss life insurance. There are three circumstances where life insurance is going to be included in the estate. So if the proceeds were used to pay the executor of the decedent's estate, if the decedent at death owned an incident of ownership in the policy, or the decedent gifted his or her policy within three years of death. That's the three-year rule right there, okay? So if I know that I have two years to live, let's make sure we're not gifting my life insurance policy to anyone because it's just going to be included right back into my state, and that's a no-no, okay? What's an incident of ownership? That is basically the power to, or the right to assign things, to terminate them, to borrow against cash reserves, to name, or to change beneficiaries, right? So if I have the power over something, the IRS sees that as something that is mine, right? So I want to make sure if I have a life insurance policy, I do not have the right to terminate it. I do not have the right to name or change beneficiaries. I need to completely clean my hands of it if I don't want it in my state. Okay. That's, it's very important. Okay. So like if you own the policy and died, the death benefit is included in your estate. Okay. If your spouse is the owner of your policy and you gift it to him and her within the three years of transfer, that death benefit is included in your estate because of the three-year rule. If you gift it to him or her and you never change the beneficiary and it just remains your estate, then it is included in your estate, right? So if you own the policy on your spouse, that replacement cost is actually included in your estate, okay? If you gift your spouse's policy to your, let's say, son, then nothing is included in your estate. Just make a mental note that any cash gifts or any other items that are gifted have no three-year rule, okay? So there's, you know, most likely going to be questions of, you know, gifts with including cash within three years of death, okay? Those have no three-year rule. They're just trying to misdirect you. Okay. So this is a lot. I know I just rattled off a lot. This is something that you're really going to have to sit with and digest, look at, listen to, whatever, right? Pay attention. Try to really, truly understand it. Okay. Like almost everything on this exam, there is rationale behind everything. Find the logic that makes sense to you in your head, right? The things with like incidents of ownership If you have power over something, it is technically yours, right? But if you can't really do anything about it, okay, well, then that's not included in the estate, right? Think of it how it makes sense to you, but take the time to think about it. So a quick note that I wanted to cover, gift tax is paid, not the gift itself, okay? Within three years of death is included in the estate, okay? So gift taxes paid, okay, within three years of death are added to the gross estate, and then taxable gifts are added to the taxable estate, and then gift tax is paid, gift tax is paid 
is subtracted from the tentative tax. Remember that calculation I kind of went through? There's a distinction between gift taxes paid and just gifting. Make sure you read those carefully when you're when you're reviewing. Moving on to other things that are includable in a gross estate, most survivorship annuities are includable and an annuity is fully included if the survivor has the right to take a lump sum. If the survivor has to receive periodic payments, then the present value of the future payments is included in the gross estate. Transfers with retained life estate, the only exception is 529 plans. Property that's transferred during the decedent's life is included in their gross estate if they retain the right to use or enjoy the property or receive income from it during their lifetime, right? So even though it's not technically my name, if I get to use, enjoy, or get income from it, the IRS sees it as mine, okay? Logic, again. So even retaining a lifetime right whether it's alone or with someone else, to designate who will own or enjoy the transferred property or its income will cause the value of that property to be included in the gross estate, okay? So if you have the ability to control anything, you know, if you can designate who's going to own it or who can enjoy or or you can personally enjoy it or you can even direct and tell who is going to get the income that is included in your estate because you have incident of ownership, you have control, okay? So exclusions are life insurance owned by others, completed gifts, and life estate for their own life only, okay? So a life estate gives the owner the absolute right to possess, enjoy, or derive income from the property for life, after which that interest terminates. So a life estate is not included in the gross estate, but a retained life estate is included. A life estate is basically a home. So you're saying that I don't own this home, but I am allowed to enjoy or derive income from it, but after my life ends, the interest in it terminates. So that's not included in my gross estate. But if I retain that life estate, obviously it's going to be included, right? If it's not terminated, it's going to be included. All right. This is all very dense. I'm kind of going down through the calculation that I had an overview of at the beginning. So in the next episode, I will be discussing adjusted gross estate. That is kind of where we're on in that little flow chart in my head. (laughs) or that list that I kind of flowed through at the start. That is it for this episode. We discuss the estate tax calculation and I begin with an overview of the calculation, the estate tax filing requirements, including the exemption and form 706, the gross estate, what is included, what is excluded, the three-year rule, which includes life insurance and gift taxes paid, incidents of ownership, survivorship annuities, and any life estates that were retained rather than terminated.